سؤالي من بلي شاد سلايدز
I request participants to keep their mics off, please. We'll just begin in a couple of seconds. People are still joining, so just let them give them some 30 seconds or so, and then we'll get started, please.
Shalini, just request you to unshare your screen, please. Good morning, all. Welcome to the fourth online talk in the No More series of Understanding Birex BIG Scheme. Today's topic is uh, how to design experiments to validate your technology. This talk would be given by Dr. Premnath. Uh, for today's talk, Venture Center is collaborating with a range of um, incubators across India. Uh, we're starting with uh, AISSMS IoT Pune, Institute of Life Sciences Bhubaneswar, Vishweshwarya National Institute of Technology BNIT Nagpur, AIC ISIL Pune Seed Foundation, DPU Foundation for Innovation, Incubation and Entrepreneurship, the Deshpande Startups Hubli Karnataka, EUR Center Anna University Chennai, Atal Incubation Center Banastali Vidya Peet Rajasthan, Savli Technology and Business Incubator STBI Gujarat, IIT Madras Bio Incubator Chennai, VIT Vellore Technology Business Incubator, Arupadai Vedu Medical College and Hospital Pondicherry. Our outreach partners for all the talks are Pune Knowledge Cluster and AIC Indian School of Business Mohali. Just to give you a brief background about the BIC scheme, BIC is a flagship program of BIRAC, which provides the right admixture of fuel and support to young startups and entrepreneurial individuals. BIG Call 21 is now open through 16th August till 5.30 p.m. In this talk series uh, today, you will understand the BIG scheme. The speaker for this will be Dr. Shalini Singh. It will be followed by how to design experiments to validate your technology. Speaker would be Dr. Premna. You'll also get pointers to success from a previous BIG grantee, Mr. Milan Chaudhary from We Innovate. I request you to post your queries in the chat box and we will take it at the end of the talk. With this, I would like to give a brief introduction to our first speaker today, Dr. Shalini Singh. Dr. Shalini Singh holds PhD in chemistry from University of Pune. She has done her postdoctoral training from RMIT University, Melbourne. Her research includes five plus experience uh, in work on synthesis and characterization of second and fourth compound semiconductor nanomaterials with various applications in the field of optoelectronic devices, biolabeling, et cetera. She is a specialist funding programs at Venture Center and is actively involved in the BIG program management through program promotion, creating awareness of science entrepreneurship, managing screening and reviewing of proposals, proposal due diligence, contract management, project monitoring, mentoring of grantees. She's also involved in developing the funding database for Venture Center. Shalini, I request you to please uh, start your presentation. I love you for your kind intro introduction and welcome to all the participants and uh, our collaborators. So is my screen visible? Uh, yes. Yeah. So as Pallavi said, the call is currently open and it will be open until uh, 16th of August, uh, 5.30 p.m. So just going back, uh, so, uh, so under Ministry of Science and Technology comes the Department of Biotechnology, uh, which has led a non-for-profit company in March 2012 um, that we all know as Biotechnology Industry Research Assistant Council, that is BIRAC. Now, BIREC has various funding schemes, and one such schemes we are going to talk about is Biotechnology Ignition Grant, that is BIG. So across India, uh, we have total eight partners. One such partner is Venture Center, who is implementing uh, this program. Uh, now, let us see the purpose of this uh, scheme. Uh, basically, it gives you a 50 lakhs of grant in aid for a period of 18 months. Uh, the funding is available for both individuals as well as startups. Now, the funding is to, for, uh, to foster the generation of ideas which are having commercialization potential uh, if, uh, to establish a proof of concept. And if you want to validate or upscale your proof of concept and also to stimulate enterprise formation. Now, the scope uh, is that the grant is in form of grant in aid. There are royalty and tech transfer clauses, which are recently added from call 16. You get mentoring, advisory, and referral support from the partners you choose. And also you benefit from the learning, visibility, and networking events, which are organized by the partner, as well as by Barak themselves. 
and you get to have uh, your ideas evaluated by the pool of experts uh, which you are having which uh, go through your proposal review them and give suggestions and feedback how to improvise further on that uh, now the highlight of this theme is that if you have some uh, technology objectives you want to establish a proof of concept you want to de-risk your technology you want to demonstrate the idea to the in investors or you want to commercialize it then this is all supported under the pyrex scheme whereas if you want to fund just plain exploratory academic research or you want to fund your phd or your idea is having no novelty and it is not having any commercialization potential or it is at a very later stage which involves lot of clinical trials or requires lot of ethical risk then this is not supported under the big scheme so these are the broad domains which are covered under this scheme like healthcare agriculture uh, industrial biotech others includes analytical methods bioinformatics bio it interface now uh, byrac has further divided these broad domains into theme and sub theme categories so healthcare is further divided to diagnostic which is further divided to sub themes uh, uh, humans animal plant drug including cytopharma vaccine regenerative medicine such as stem cells uh, agriculture is further divided to secondary agriculture fisheries poultry aquaponics sericulture and so on industrial biotechnology uh, um, is divided to bioenergy sanitization waste management in collaboration to uh, machine learning iot or automation so if you have any idea which falls under this theme and you can choose any sub theme then you are eligible to apply under this scheme so the process flow uh, i'll just run through the process flows to get an idea that what is the timeline uh, when you get the project started so once the, uh, the call is open which is open twice a year as you all know uh the it is go into the eligibility uh, round where the basic eligibility legal eligi eligibility is done after which a preliminary screening is done for the proposal and then uh, once you clear that your proposal is assigned to online reviewers five uh, reviewers review proposal and they score you there's a cut off decided by the committee if the proposal fall above the cut off then you have been called for the presentation where you face the reviewers face to face for the first time and you give a presentation here again the reviewers the committee will uh, score you and there will be again a cut off decided uh, here in the meeting and the final decision will be taken based on the cut off that how many get funded for this grant once you get selected for this grant a due diligence by the chosen partner will be done and then there will be an agreement signing and release of first tranche so these two typically takes a uh, two months of time whereas this whole process will be done in 135 days so uh, eligibility talking about the eligibility if you are applying as a startup then make sure that minimum 51% of capital is owned by resident indian citizens the company is under 5 years old and uh, the company can have their own r&d space but if it is not there then you have to get incubated uh, from this startup uh, one has to uh, find a pro committed project leader who will be responsible for taking all the technical and managerial aspect of the project and he must be a shareholder in this company and he must have completed his basic graduation which could be in any discipline whereas if you plan to apply as an individual then you have to be an indian citizen for individual it is mandatory that they get incubated in a incubator and they must have completed their basic graduation which could be in any discipline uh, now the individual who is the project leader here he has to give his full time and if you are coming from any uh, non for profit organization then make sure you have your organizational policies for faculty spin offs uh why an incubator or an incubator is basically a dedicated physical facility which will uh, provide access to your scientific work Uh, they will give you mentoring and advisory support uh they should these incubators must have a formal long term approvals from the host institution or from byrac or from nsdtb now the applicants coming up from faculty or students cannot claim their own academic or research lab as an incubator 
so they must have these formal uh, approvals so when you are applying for this uh, scheme you should have a letter of intent from the incubator and once you get the grant a mou with the incubator will be asked so your chosen incubator may or may not be your big partner so as i show uh, i have I've shown in my earlier slides that there are total eight partners so among these eight partners you can choose any one who will help you to implement this program but to carry out your scientific work you can choose any incubator which is closer to your locations uh, for example if you are located in guwahati you can choose uh, iit guwahati uh, as your incubator but you can also choose venture center as your implementing partner who will implement who will uh, monitor your progress and do the release of your fund uh so uh, basically how the evaluation is done on what basis the experts score you so here is a quick slide which will tell you that the novelty of your idea carries maximum 20 marks the value proposition uh, proposition which you are proposing will carry maximum 20 marks business perspective or commercialization potential carries 15 marks and maximum ca uh, marks carries that is 30 marks for technical viability team strength carries 15 marks and some marks are also allocated for the strategy you show to overcome challenges which could be in your ip or it could be in your regulatory or environment or ethical facilities etc and some marks are also there how well you plan your project for 18 months with the proposed budget so this is the scoring uh, system which the experts follow and on basis of this the scores are given so some quick tips and pointers when you are applying for this um, program uh, then that the project must have the proof of concept novelty must be emphasized uh, it should be technically feasible uh, you please check for any ip barriers or freedom to operate for your idea uh, there should be a clarity in business model and clear indication of the project leader that he wants to commercialize this of course a credible and complete team which will make this goals achievable in 18 months and with the proposed budget so uh, when you are filling up the application form you will be asked to plan your uh, objectives uh, where you need to give the uh, activities which you plan for the 18 months uh, you have to give the start month of start of activity end of activity and what is the indicator that this particular activity is achieved So let me just show you the one one of the examples. So this is how you will need to plan your milestones, uh, spread over eighteen months, giving your targets and indicators that these targets have been achieved. So Bayrak have their budget um, and their guidelines. They have these particular heads, and some of the heads like equipment, manpower, outsourcing services are capped at maximum thirty percent. So you cannot. exceed these uh, heads so uh, when you are uh, planning your uh, budget please uh, make sure that you go through the guidelines and stick to the heads which are capped at 15 lakhs so this is the uh, success story uh, where you can see the we have been partner from call four and the number of applications received for this scheme have been increases Uh, has been increasing and this is the um, statistic for last call 20 and if you see the in principle approval is very less compared to the number of application received so this current um, call final result are yet to be announced uh, which will be announced soon in this month uh, but if you see the in principle approval you will get through that this scheme is very competitive and you need to work for writing this uh, proposal and preparing for this uh, application uh, now i'll just uh, go through few slides to give you our idea or to give you a feel from different domains how people have applied for this scheme and how well they are doing uh, after this dig so one such example is of dr anuya nissel who is a scientist in ncl who applied for this uh big grant and she got it for this product seriosis orthopedics 
which is used for the uh, orthopedics and uh, currently she is also developed two more products that is Cerimid that are used for breast cancer and Ceridrum for advanced wound care and also raised the follow-on funding like Sibri grant for which is for animal and uh, clinical trials. Uh, one more example is of an individual applicant who applied as an individual now has formed a company that is Puma Labs. The idea was basically to convert the agriculture crop residue waste to the material for packaging and furniture applications. Uh, they have now formed their first decentralized facilities, also uh, made various national and international collaborations and won uh, various awards for their proposed idea. Uh, one more example is of Dr. Uh, Vaishali Kulkani. She was a PhD student uh, when she applied for this scheme and uh, she had applied for this uh, grant in two, uh, 2018 for her idea uh, for having a non-GMO sustainable natural biopigments. And now she has raised various follow-on funding from the investors like Chirate Ventures. And also she has been got various awards from L'Oreal Innovation Runway Singapore. And very proud to show that this year uh, her um, color palettes were uh, shown at LACME Fashion Week. So these are some of the stories of our successful grantees who have been doing very good uh, after their uh, BIG journey. And these are some of the um, media coverage which our grantees have gone for their uh, devices and for their ideas. And in various fields, whether it is agri or devices or diagnostics, so some more pictures of our grantees being shown, um, their news have been covered by Z and they have been covered by the media coverage. And these are recently um, the products which were launched in at biotech startup Expo, which was inaugurated by uh, Prime Minister, and so four of our uh, grantees' products were launched. And this is a snapshot of the product which will soon come into market, and some are under clinical trials. And if you want to get inspired more, you can please uh, join our social media handle where we have started uh, these social media stories of our grantee. Uh, which where you can read about them, how they uh, how they started their journey, how they applied, what were the difficulties, and how well they are doing uh, after their uh, BIG grant is done. So uh, please meet our core team where I uh, and Pala will look after this project monitoring. Uh, mentoring is taken by Dr. Premnath and Dr. Smita, and uh, financial and overall project management is done by Dr. Manisha and Truthi. I thank you all for your patience listening. Uh, if you have any query regarding the eligibility or you want any mentoring support or you want to help find any help while applying for the scheme, please feel free to write to us over these IDs or you may also call us on this number. Thank you so much. Please do connect on our social media handle. Okay. Thank you, Shani for giving the overview of the BIG scheme and also giving different inputs on the aspects of the application. We are going to have uh, the next talk by Dr. Premnath. But before that, I would like to take a quick poll. We want to understand our audience. So it's just going to be a quick 30-second uh, poll. I request you all to put your give your inputs here so that we can understand you better. Yes, we're getting your responses. Okay, we've received 50%. Yeah, we have 50% participation, so I'll just uh, show the results.
there are more academicians uh, uh, from from the first question, and then we have more industrial biotech and uh, devices, uh, as well as agriculture here uh, from the domains uh, that we have polled for. Thank you. Uh, so now I would request uh, Dr. Premna to give a talk on how to design experiments to validate your technology. A brief bio of Dr. Premnath here. Uh, he is the head NCL innovations at CSR NCL and founder director at Venture Center, the national award winning in inventive enterprises and deep tech incubator. Dr. Premnath is a technology developer, innovation and incubation manager, startup mentor, and a co-founder of two medtech startups. One of his inventions, a breakthrough material for hip and knee joint replacements, has been implanted in more than a million patients worldwide. Another technology for porous maxillofacial implants has been implanted in thousands of patients in India and abroad. He has provided leadership for teams that have won national awards for technology, technology development, intellectual property management, and business incubation. He is chemical engineer and alumnus of MIT in the US, IIT Bombay Distinguished Alumnus 2022 and has been a Shevning Technology Enterprise Scholar in Cambridge, UK. Over to you, sir. Alavi, can you give me access, please share screen access? Yes, sir. So I've given you access. Can you see my screen? Yes, sir. Can you hear me clearly. Yeah. Okay. okay uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm very happy to be here today. Uh, I'll share some pointers on designing experiments uh, for technology, uh, de-risking kind of uh, projects, especially those which are subject matter for uh, BIG kind of projects. So, Pallavi, please alert me a few minutes before uh, the time allotted to me. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so the topic is how to design experiments to validate your uh, technology. And I'm going to uh, try and cover a few points. But before that, a few preliminary points so that you're we are all on the same page. And then we can take it uh, uh, from uh, there ahead. Um, a few things about technology de-risking itself first. Uh, it's important to, I mean, I'm of course simplifying it here, but there is uh, uh, the kind of projects that you're dealing with when you're doing technology de-risking are different in nature from what you do typically in exploratory research. Many of us in academic organizations or in projects which are more academic in nature tend to do exploratory research. Uh, and uh, here we're talking about very focused technology de-risking projects. So a typical exploratory research project, the starting point is curiosity. You just want to know how things work, uh, why does it happen? Uh, you know, what are those things that you're seeing there? It's more curiosity oriented and the purpose is discovering new knowledge. Sometimes it is developing new tools, methods of study and so on. You want to be able to understand something better. You figure out a new way to uh, do that. Technology de-risking projects, on the other hand, are very focused. The starting point is usually an idea for a solution to a problem. So always there's a problem. There is a solution to it, and there's an idea that this solution might work for this problem. And the purpose of your exercise, of your experiments, is primarily to generate evidence that the solution works and that you're de-risking it and validating it at different stages. Okay, So that is the objective of a technology de-risking project. So typical BIG kind of projects are technology de-risking projects. Most innovation funding project, uh, programs focus on technology de-risking. That includes BIG, SBRI, BIPP, so on and so forth in the BIRAC portfolio uh, and others also like, for example, when you do prototyping in Nidhi Prayas and DST or other programs as well, uh, you will find that this is the objective. Let's just understand this in a few quick slides and then I'll come back to the main ones. So as I told you, every technology idea has these few important elements. There's a problem definition or a need that you've identified and a bunch of components you're putting together as a solution uh, to solve that problem. And there's a technology idea. Now, even you will notice that even when you're pitching a proposal for BIG, you'll be talking roughly about a problem and then a solution you're proposing and then how you're going to do a study to de-risk it over a period of 
uh, time. So this framework is simple, but it's quite important as well. Now, in why are we de-risking it? We are de-risking it because we are trying to take it to market. And it's quite well known that the concept, the origin of the idea in the very beginning, that the invention part, which is on the left side of this graph, by the way, the innovation process is never so simple, linear. It's always complicated, but it's good enough for learning purposes right now, uh, which is that on the we, are, we usually work on the left side, right? We come up with ideas, we connect a solution to a problem, and this can happen by different people. This can happen different times. Um, you know, problem definition might have happened 10 years back. So it was waiting for a solution or solution was arrived at and it's waiting for a uh, problem to solve, right? And then you put them together. That's where the typical inventor comes in who puts these two together to come up with a technology idea, solution for a problem. And then you do proofs of proof of concepts, prototypes and so on and so forth and take it to market, right? Now it's well known that the rest of the journey uh, which is after the invention is extremely uh, resource intensive. That's where much of the effort actually happens. While the left part is very interesting, the right is where the much, of, much of the effort happens. And when you have to put in so much resources by people, by investors and so on and so forth, you need a vehicle to incentivize everybody to perform and that's where a startup comes in. Okay. If you don't have that, you won't be able to raise resources to make uh, this, uh, uh, you know, to progress this idea to a product in use. And that is the name of the game in building startups, uh, commercializing technologies, de-risking them over a period of uh, time as well. Okay. So here uh, in this, uh, um, the, the idea is very simple. So as we go to the right, we are progressively de-risking technology and it takes time. And as it happens, you're increasing the value of the company or the technology, but the technology first. And because of that, the value of the company goes up. And therefore you're able to raise more and more money as you go along to be able to take it to market uh, as well. Uh, there's another concept here called technology readiness levels. And this is something which uh, Bayrak also uses. Uh, this originated in the US with NASA and other such organizations. So if you go and Google online, you'll find these technology readiness level scales. So uh, you will find that TRL1 is about basic principles that have been observed and a technology concept has been formulated by TRL2. And then you progress it progressively to TRL9, TRL9 being the actual uh, use of it in field, in real life situations, in commercial settings, okay? Um, Usually, uh, you want to progress, and this is actually the technology readiness level is also an indicator of how you're progressively de-risking it. Um, in BIA, in Bayrak's website, you'll find a tech TRL scale for multiple domains like this. Uh, you can look it up, just Google for Bayrak and TRL scale, you'll find these. And when you're defining your projects, this is a useful guide also to tell you how you want to de-risk. Uh, an example of this, I'm just showing you very quickly out here, uh, is one for medical devices and diagnostics, which I've taken from the online site. Uh, you will find, for example, that if it's an implant, yeah, your needs are identified. There's some, you know, uh, FTO kind of, uh, uh, you've, you've formulated the idea and you know that there's freedom to practice. And then you complete some results, you show some data that it will work, at least in, in the, as a proof of concept level. Okay, so that is what you would want to do. And this is also an indicator of how you want to progressively de-risk your technology. Of course, every technology is unique. So the story will be different in each case, but uh, this is a useful uh, uh, thing to look up and be aware of. Um, many of you will be familiar with the use of a version of this, which is used in drug development. So in drug development, for example, this is how the process might look. You might go from drug research to drug discovery and then preclinical development to clinical trials, and then finally regulatory approvals and authorization. And in this chart, you can also show see uh, it has numbers on rough, some rough numbers on where the costs might, you might incur costs <laughs> and what is the success probability at each stage and how much time it takes at each stage. So clearly in drug development, it's a long uh, uh, process, with considerable risks, considerable investments, but you'll notice that much of the investment is happening towards the clinical trials say, stage and the success probability is improving dramatically at that stage as well. So you're de progressively de-risking it. And at some point, you know, your risk is reducing to a point where you become more attractive. 
So it's not a surprise that many uh, people who are doing drug development work often raise money. Uh, small companies doing drug development work will raise money after phase one. Okay, uh, because that's where the acceleration is going to happen and investors are going to see a climb in valuation. So they want to participate in that climb in uh, valuation as you go along. So now coming back to designing experiments. So as I told you, designing experiments here, we are doing it in order to de-risk technology and progressively hit certain, reduce certain risks. So there's some risk milestones and you're progressively reducing those and therefore it hits certain value milestones and that basically results in you being able to raise that money as well okay so the purposes of these experiments uh, can be multifold in such uh, kind of situations so i have listed a few out here the first one which you want to do of course and which is very common in big is demonstrate proof that the proposed solution works so you have a concept that this solution is going to solve this problem show that it indeed works and each uh, each solution uh, will have a set of parameters you need to define which indicates that it indeed works <clears throat> as you go along you will need to also indicate that it works every time there are some standardized sops it works when you scale up it works uh, when somebody else does the same study and so on that means there's uh, repeatability and reproducibility all of that so these are all part of your exercise of de-risking so when you generate do these experiments you'll design it to demonstrate those results that look my solution works it works reliably it works whether i do the experiment or somebody else does the experiment it works when i do it in uh, 10 people versus 30 people uh, and so on and so forth right so you're basically reducing the variability uh, showing that that variability is not affecting uh, is uh, your uh, usefulness of the solution then there is one other important thing, which is called proof of value, which is basically the proof that the solution delivers value that is being claimed. This is slightly different from showing proof of concept. Uh, you know, if you take a typical customer, uh, they see value uh, in your product because you are claiming that it does something better than alternatives available over there, right? So there'll be alternatives and you will say that we are superior to it, that we deliver the basic goods and we are superior in some way. So that value that is being delivered is in the context. So the value proposition, as they say, is in the context of alternatives that are available. And you need to demonstrate proof of value for that. And that can be a different set of experiments. So you can easily imagine that I might need to compare my data with an alternative in order to show proof of value. Whereas to show proof of concept, I may not need to do that, okay, in terms of comparing it with an alternative product that is available in the market, right? Now, the next set of data that you might need is data that your funders and investors want to see to convince themselves that, you know, that you're on the right track. And this may, this part of it might be proof of concept, part of it might be proof of value, but there may be more to it as well. For example, uh, there might be certain concerns about technical feasibility of, say, maybe uh, the supply chain. That means it works, your product works, solution is all good, but you're not sure, uh, you know, if uh, you will have the right materials so or the materials will be consistent every time, raw materials will be consistent, or that it's commercially viable. Um, sometimes it may not be commercially viable at that time, but if they might want to know whether you have a path to commercial viability, right? So you need to design experiments to show that you have that path well thought, th thought through. And of course, as above, proof of value, quality, superiority is also important. So in a diagnostic, for example, somebody might want to understand what are your specificity and sensitivity numbers for a diagnostic in order to understand whether it does meet the quality requirements for their app use case, right? And by the way, that's very, very specific to the use case, right? There might also be some data that customers want and some data which your key opinion leaders want. In many knowledge intensive areas, uh, these are all KOL driven markets. That means there are key opinion leaders who shape whether a product is accepted or not. They could be uh, experts in the field, uh, doctors, clinicians, so on and so forth. And, uh, uh, you know, they might want to see data which is suitable or of a quality that is acceptable to a reputed journal, for example, right? Uh, and uh, that might be an indicator for them of whether that work is reputable or not, right? 
So you might need to create that kind of data uh, in, in those cases. And customers might want to seek entirely different set of data. Uh, their requirements might be different than some of the key opinion leaders. For example, the, the patient sees a different set of data than, or may ask for a different set of data than uh, the KOLs uh, might, right? KOLs, for example, if it's a product which has, say, part therapeutic and part cosmetic effect, uh, a KOL might focus on the therapeutic effect and the customer might focus on the uh, cosmetic effect as well, right? And they might want to see that data, right? So you need to be clear which data you're generating for whom. And then the regulators, right? And here I want to point out a few things, the regulators and the certifying bodies and some other industries. Uh, usually, uh, for example, in medical devices, the regulators will look for safety, uh, efficacy, and that you're not making unreasonable claims, right? This is the evidence that they're looking for. The first phase is safety and the second efficacy. And the last is evidence supporting whatever regulated claims. So if you're saying that this treats somebody, uh, that is a regulated claim, okay? And the, you need to provide evidence for it. If you are saying that this is just fun data that people are going to collect and see for themselves whether their heart is beating right and there's no medical claim you're making, then you're free to sell it like Fitbit, okay? That's not a regulated uh, 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 product uh, once you do that, okay? But if it's a medical product and there is a regulated claim uh, and that you're claiming something which will decide on therapy and so on, treatment uh, or action being taken by a medical professional, then there's a uh, consequence to it and it will be you will have to provide evidence for it now there's a there's an important thing to keep in mind here uh, that regulators sometimes will specify uh, will want to see data generated the way they want it so uh, in in many cases you might have a situation where the regulator might say that you will generate this data after you get a test license from me okay and which basically means that the data which you generated before getting the test license is not something they are going to use for their activities, for their uh, study or for their approvals. So this is an important thing to keep in mind. One should plan as an innovator that there may be a phase when once you've sort out, uh, sorted out everything, you will get into a phase where you'll get your test licenses and then generate certain kinds of data which a regulator might need in the dossier. Okay, so academic trials, which, you know, there are many uh, students or uh, faculty just rapidly going and doing academic studies uh, that may not be uh, that may not be useful for your regulatory approvals. It might build credibility. Uh, it might give you some KOL uh, credibility, but need not give you the data that you need for regulatory approvals. So you might have to redo the entire thing again. So be careful about that because it costs money to do all of those uh, uh, studies as well. And finally, data for strengthening your patents and IP position. And there are many dimensions to this. The first dimension is if somebody else has a patent in the area and is pre preventing you from practicing it, you don't need to find a way to go around it. You need to do experiments to find a workaround. <clears throat> but in other situations, there might be uh, cases where you want to file patents and you need to figure out novel elements to file patents uh, to protect your own technology. And furthermore, to expand its reach, to make it more attractive, to make it more, uh, to cover the ground so that other people don't chase you down, um, there might also be some experiments and data generation that you might do to protect your patent position, okay? So these are all possibilities for which you might be generating uh, data. A few key, uh, I mean, just gonna quickly go through some technology risk items. And then uh, um, I, we are, this is a short talk, so we can do a more detailed one some other day. But there are several types of risks associated with technology development. And you must be, uh, just keep it in the back of your mind. It might be risks associated with raw materials, equipment, methods or processes, the expertise, the people carrying that expertise, the measurement risk, the IP risk, the regulatory risk, all these are different types of risks. And you need to navigate these as an entrepreneur. By the way, uh, every entrepreneur is, uh, you know, has to be a good risk manager. Not, not be averse to risk because without risk, you don't have rewards, but uh, you need to manage those risks. So you need to be aware of it and manage it and not necessarily run away from it, okay? That's not what entrepreneurs do. They don't take the shortcut out. They will basically manage these risks well. So when you're doing some of these de-risking activities, 
you have to first identify what is a critical unknown in what you're proposing. Whatever you're proposing, there'll be an unknown. And then you design an experiment to figure out what is that answer to that unknown. So suppose I am doing a diagnostic and the unknown is whether it is specific enough or not. I will design an experiment to get a number for specificity, right? That's as simple as that. But in each domain, it will be slightly different uh, depending upon what you're doing. Now, in this process, uh, many people uh, get confused uh, between uh, balancing knowns and unknowns, okay? So in your typical know-how, there might be different parts, some which are known and some which you'll have to define as specifically unknown. One temptation for many academics or others to say is everything is unknown, right? They think it's absolutely novel, which is hardly ever true. And actually it is detrimental to them because uh, it's always good to rely on good literature evidence for the things which are known and only focus on the things which are unknown, which are usually the novel elements in your idea, right? So you want to say that X uh, out of these four boxes here, three are known, well-established. I'm not debating that and people will agree with you. The leap I'm making is a red box out here and that is unknown. And that's where I'm going to generate data to show that it indeed what I'm claiming works. So preliminary data can be used for that. In BIG, for example, they might ask you preliminary data for this part uh, of, the, uh, of the study that you're proposing, right? Or comparables, that it has worked in another situation, an equivalent strategy. I think it will work here as well, right? That is another uh, uh, way to look at it and that there's a reasonable chance of it working. So usually reviewers in uh, 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 programs like BIG are open to that risk in the sense, uh, uh, you know, if there's a reasonable chance of working, they might give you uh, the you know, benefit of doubt and allow you to progress. But you have to show that there's a reasonable chance of working, especially if you're making a very daring claim or a daring leap uh, um, out here uh, as well. Uh, you might have to do experiments in the very beginning to do what is called uh, risk, uh, risk due to repeatability and reproducibility. Um, well, I don't have time today, but you, uh, I hope some of you will read up more about repeatability and reproducibility and how you want to design those experiments uh, to ensure that your, whatever you're measuring is reliable. Please remember, this is not just about generating some data and publishing it. It is me decide whether your product will be commercial or not, whether the investments that you're taking in are, uh, are going to bear fruit or not. So it's really serious out here to ensure that your measurement methods are reliable and also that good measurement methods exist. You also want to be able to, uh, in certain things like diagnostics, the risk, uh, one of the key risks and a risk inflection point for your uh, technology would be when you determine sensitivity and specificity for your uh, technology. And this is something which uh, everybody working in diagnostics should be doing this right. Uh, a couple of points I want to point out here is that when you design your experiments, design your experiments keeping in mind a question that you're going to answer first. Don't just start generating data without defining the question. Okay. Uh, most such calculations uh, use a gold standard and you compare with how you did compared to a gold standard, okay? And which basically means that there'll be a yes or no answer at the end of it. And yes or no answers can only be done if you have a question in place, right? So is this person COVID positive or not? That's a question, okay? If that's a question, you have a benchmark, you have a reference method, a gold standard method, and you have your method and you can then compare it. If you don't frame the question right, if your question says, I, I'm just going to measure concentration of uh, viral load, that doesn't give you a yes or no answer. Okay. And that basically means that you will not be able to pull out those numbers in terms of sensitivity and specificity uh, that people might be asking you to do. Okay. Um, in some cases, you also need to have animal models to do all these studies. And this can be a considerable risk as well. So very often in therapeutics, for example, you might need to develop animal models to get things done. And uh, this can be a key bottleneck. So your experiments might have to uh, also focus on, you know, uh, what kind of model systems you're going to use to demonstrate your data that your regulators want. 
There are also risks associated with scale up. Many of you are familiar with them. The scale up again requires you to do experiments which are at different scale to demonstrate that your thing works. It's well known that uh, scaling doesn't happen linearly. And that basically means uh, that something that worked at uh, you know, 100 ml scale doesn't work at uh, one liter scale, doesn't work at 10 liter scale. So what do you do in which that case? You have to demonstrate that it indeed uh, works as well. Finally, a few points about IP strategy. I have told you about this. Basically, your experiments are designed to ensure that your SOP uh, has freedom to practice. That means nobody else's IP is stopping you from practicing it. Right? So your experimental protocol uh, will try to avoid those elements where other people have patented uh, uh, things, uh, patented steps in your processes. You might also design experiments to generate the data needed for your patent. Very often uh, in patents, uh, it's a good practice to also show failures. That means all the different experiments that failed and the one that worked, uh, both are shown. Why? Because the claim is that you did something and something surprising ended up happening, a non-obvious thing ended up happening. That comes out better when you show that you know you tried experiments which failed and one of them worked and that seems to be the golden recipe that you have come up with and that is inventive. So experimental data which are failures are also very useful uh, in uh, uh, filing uh, good patterns uh, and also widening uh, your claims because when you're widening your claims you need to consider various combinations uh, to arrive at the same solution so that other people don't chase you down or bypass your uh, IP, especially if you're investing a lot of money in your IP, like in pharma and so on and so forth. Okay, so I think I'm going to leave that out. I'll close with this last uh, two slides on uh, with an example. So I'm taking a rapid diagnostic. So I'm taking the first uh, in the format which I talked about just now. The first part is the knowns, right? So uh, you need to ensure you don't want everything unknown. So let's figure out the knowns. So what are the knowns? The need is undisputed and known. That means most BIG reviewers would want to ensure that you have at least the need that you're working on is undisputed, right? So here is an example, uh, which I have put down. I'm saying there's a need for a 30 minute RT-PCR kit for airports to rule out COVID-19 carriers with 100% accuracy, okay? And I said rule out, okay? I didn't say who are positive. I said rule out people, okay? Uh, that they are definitely, you know, negative, right? You want 100% detection of negative cases, okay? Now, if that was the case, right, you are here, uh, this is a need, and uh, I think it's fairly undisputed. And the problem is well understood. That means air travelers are big carriers of this disease. Air travel is high, uh, has higher risk. Uh, current tests take too long and false negatives are uh, high in the case of, um, 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 you know, uh, some of the rapid kits that are available. So the underlying science has to also been established, right? Most technology and innovation financing schemes will not fund you for doing science, okay, for establishing the science. They're only funding you to do de-risking, right? So you want to show that the underlying science is established. So we know that COVID-19 virus signature is known, RT-PCR method is known and established and so on and so forth right? And that is, these are the knowns. Now let's look at the unknowns. So the unknowns, the questions you will, you will pose are something like this. So the proof of concept question is, can the RT-PCR be done in 30 minutes? Because that's a big claim that you're making, okay, I, in this particular technology that you're proposing to do. The de-risking might be, does it have repeatability, reproducibility? Does it have the right sensitivity and specificity, right? For certifications, if it involves a device or whatever, you might need to do third-party tests, uh, generate third-party test data, and somebody might want to see that. The proof of value here might be slightly different. The claim that you made was that in an airport setting, it will give you a quicker uh, result and low number of false negatives. So the proof of value for a user is, does it give quicker and low false negatives compared to rapid antigen and conventional RT-PCR tests, right? So that is your statement for which you'll design your uh, experiment in order to prove that it indeed creates value for the user, which is distinct from any other solution that is available over there. 
For freedom to operate, you will ask the question, does the SOP or the method or the tools you're using, does it infringe another patent? And if it does, what is the workaround, right? So you'll design your experiments for workaround in that case. If, you, if it's for your own patent that you're going to file, you will ask the question, does data illustrate novelty and non-obviousness? And that's unknown there. And you need to generate data for novelty to demonstrate it's new uh, compared to all that has been uh, written by others and non-obvious compared to other uh, uh, closest alternatives that are available over there. That means you made a leap uh, and which is not obvious to somebody reasonably skilled in the art, okay? Um, IP coverage, does it block competitors? Is it defendable? Is there data for adequate variations? Have you tried out multiple variations and protected different possibilities? And for KOLs, for key opinion leaders, uh, the question they might ask you is, is the data that you have reliable? Has it been published in, say, a good journal or not? Okay. Uh, has it been peer reviewed? Uh, is there other holes in the data that you're, you're uh, showing over there? So you can see how the KOL has shifted the focus in terms of the kind of data that you need to generate over there. These are key opinion leaders. Okay. And for clinical PIs, the PIs who might be running your uh, clinical studies, they wouldn't take the risk if they were not uh, comfortable with the data that you're showing, right? So they will want to know is the data convincing and credible. So the uh, this is the, the doctors who might lead your clinical study, okay? And uh, was it done with credible methods and partners? Was the data from reliable sources and so on and so forth? These kind of questions might come up from a clinical PI. And for the CDSCO submission, there'll be other questions. Is it safe? What shows that it is safe? Does it do what it claims? Efficacy. Is data generated after a test license? For example, you have to take a test license, then generate maybe your preclinical uh, animal data, or maybe even uh, get into, uh, you know, and of course, get uh, you need that before you get into regulatory uh, clinical trials. Okay. Uh, is data from an approved NABL lab. In diagnostics, for example, they might say, I want to see data from an NABL lab, which say does similar uh, testing, but we're not with, uh, with uh, gold standard methods or competitor methods, and they do the same thing with your method uh, as well. And is the cl clinical study design approved by them? That means the design of the study has been approved before you started. And is the population chosen well? Is the statistics okay? And so on. So these would decide how you do the experiment. So finally, so this is what might happen. You might decide that the PO, the, uh, the proof of value study, POV study, is basically something where you took a gold standard, conventional RT-PCR, a new method, which is yours, and a benchmark comparator, maybe a rapid antigen. And you did, say, uh, 200 samples and looked at how the numbers come up. Okay, So you can see that the question is basically saying, did it detect positive or not, right? So with each of these methods and uh, somewhere um, uh, it is matching, some places it is not. For example, number two, the benchmark is showing negative, your method is showing positive and therefore you'll be able to calculate a bunch of numbers which you can find online of how sensitivity and specificity is calculated. And without that number, uh, you know, your method will not be able to prove its value against alternative uh, methods. So I think this is the quickest example I can give you. We had only, I think, 25 minutes or half an hour. So I will stop here. Uh, thank you. I'm open to a few questions if time permits. Otherwise, I'll leave the floor to Pallavi. So we can take a few questions right now. So, um, they were in this, uh, some of them are in the chat box. I'll just take it up soon. <laughs> so um, there was a question from Prithvi for startups where only lab tests were completed uh, are completed, but clinical trials can only be done after the startup. Uh, how do we uh, generate the data? So first of all, uh, before if you are doing regulatory trials, that means which the regulator will be willing to consider, you have to get your uh, first go to the regulator, get your study approved, and then start with it. Right. So you'll need some kind of a uh, uh, test license to do that. So that is important to do. And that will probably be in the name of your company. So you'll have to build your company out. You can't just keep doing things as an academic researcher. At some point, without a company, you will be wasting your time getting all these studies done because it, it builds credibility, but it doesn't go too far because at the end of the day, all the 
approval, certifications, the QMS requirements all have to be in the name of the company. Okay. Yeah. So uh, if you're an academic pursuing this, you know, at proof of concept, if you think the data looks great and you can advance it a little bit more, but at some point when investments are becoming larger, you should consider commercializing it using a company or a vehicle. Don't try to do it in an academic setting. It doesn't work. Okay. So, sorry, uh, Pallavi, did you have uh, what? I don't know if it answered the question. Yes. But yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir, it did. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So, any other questions, please? Yes, sir. So, there are also questions. What is a better strategy, whether to design and ex execute experiments on your own or getting them done from some accredited lab for regulatory clearance? Yeah. So, normally, uh, uh, yeah. So, first, let me first tell you how we would do it. Um, see, until you get your prototype fairly certain uh, or you know that everything works reliably, you will try and do as much as possible in-house, right? Um, you don't want to spend too much money because of all the certified labs will cost quite a lot. So you want to ensure that you have ironed out as many creases as possible. So for example, if it's a, a product like a device, uh, you will ensure that it works well every time that your product is very uh, stable, reliable. Uh, it, it is ready to be given to a third party for testing. And, uh, it, and um, it's also at a place where once you get the data, right, that's a one-time thing and you don't have to go back again to generate data because you made changes to the instrument. Okay, Because the regulator will take the data from whatever, whichever you're submitting, they will say, show me data for that version. You can't keep showing data from different versions, right? So first uh, thing you do is you make sure everything is done in-house. Even if you do outside, uh, you do it with uh, not with, you'll do it with reliable parties, but it may not be the one which you're going to finally, uh, you know, uh, um, get it as certified data by a third party, okay? Now, once you are there in terms of a prototype, which is ready, for generating that final data, which will go into the dossier, you should have, uh, you know, by then you probably have done your, like in medical devices, it'll be ISO 13485 certifications and so on and so forth. You would have got that, you would have made your device according to quality requirements. You would have got your test license and then you give it to somebody to, uh, uh, you know, generate the final data. And that does cost quite a lot of money, which means that you must have uh, good, uh, uh, you, sh you should make sure that the money counts uh, and it is useful for your regulatory submissions. Okay. Uh, whose question was that, please? So, uh, I think from the SIP fellows in the Adventure Center. Yeah. So, this is a two, two step kind of process that we would use in most cases. And the, this final data that you generate. That should be useful for your pitches to investors, to your funding agencies and all of that, because it does have value. In diagnostics, for example, uh, the regulator may ask you to do tests with an NABL accredited lab, okay? For the submissions, even for the test license, okay? So please be clear that that time you will need it, but not necessarily, uh, uh, not uh, necessarily when you're streamlining your product and getting it to a point where it is reliable enough and works beautifully every time okay and you're happy with that version next yeah. any other question so, so from them they, uh, they had this follow-up question about whether their studies are considered authentic it means how do our studies uh, uh, are they considered authentic by the authorities it means if yeah. the inventor yeah so, yeah. so see uh, um, uh, as i told you there is a uh, you know the uh, they will want to see what is your study design, how you generated data and all of that, right? So they will, wa they will want to check all those things, but you know, uh, there is uh, a third party lab gives them some consolation. And of course they want it from NABA labs and so on, but you know, your data in certain cases, they will be willing to accept. I mean, it's not that they can, they will not accept it entirely, but it is a, it, everybody has, you know, if nobody trusted anybody, it will go nowhere. So I think there is a, it's just a matter of you being credible when you're asked to present and communicate and so on and so forth. That's how people gauge whether it is reliable or not. Also, you know, if you have done uh, publications, published it, somebody else has peer reviewed it, all that also adds some value 
uh, when a, when a reviewer is looking at it, even somebody invited by the regulator. Okay. Yeah. yeah, we have some responses from the attendees as well that for regulatory approvals, data from certified lab is needed at that point, as you said. Um, the next question is about valuation of our company. How to do valuation of our company? Yeah, that's not the subject not of this discussion. Yes. Uh, but basically, uh, the short answer is uh, that uh, valuation is 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 like a price that you place on a product that you want to buy. It's always negotiated. There is no absolute standards for it. Uh, there are people who uh, who do valuation with using certain methods, uh, but there's nothing sacrosanct about it. So uh, this question, uh, you shouldn't waste too much of your time unless uh, it is really pressing and somebody is asking you. Otherwise, there are ways to do that. And we run this in our some of our city camp programs or startup 101 where we show one one or two methods of valuation as well. Okay, So you can join in and attend that. Uh, it's a little longer discussion. I can't take it up here. OK. Yeah. So Arun, I think you, can, you should attend one of the Startup 101 sessions and you know, get, get an idea from there. Uh, next question is from Dr. Shrikant Sali. Uh, for medical devices, test license is best obtained after POC, but before validating the device in clinical trials. Is, that is a question. Is that right? Yeah, so a test license is something which allows you to create samples uh, uh, for uh, clinical trials. It allows you to generate data uh, which uh, the regulator wants to see, right? Uh, so it's usually done, um, uh, you know, when you're ready to generate the final data for your dossier, okay? So in implants, uh, you would first... Uh, you know, submit for say a test license uh, before uh, you go and uh, um, uh, get your uh, uh, final say animal test data done because they may want to see how it is done and what's the quality of data. And then later again, uh, you know, for your clinical trial approvals. Uh, without that, they won't let you do the clinical trials for regulatory purposes. So that's what uh, ends up um, happening. Okay. Okay. There was uh, one question from Rajesh Gokli. What is the role of incubator in this entire process? Yeah. So, the, so let's understand what an incubator is, right? Incubator is creating an ecosystem to support startups. Uh, it is basically plugging in the holes in your path of taking a idea from concept to the market. So, for example, uh, some incubators will focus on only mentoring, right? There are first generation entrepreneurs who have never done business in their life, don't understand uh, much about business. They need to have that uh, understanding, confidence, some experience from mentors and so on and so forth. At different stages, you need resources of different kind, not only money, facilities, uh, experts, networks, all of those. Uh, that also comes in at different stages. Many incubators provide that at different stages. Uh, there are specific gaps in specific industries. For example, uh, in Venture Center, for example, we are in, in the medtech space. Uh, we have even built an ISO 13485 certified clean room, uh, which allows uh, startups to do samples uh, for their clinical trials using our uh, facility. Okay, so that is a hole that we saw in the ecosystem, we filled it up, right? Uh, and uh, other holes could be, for example, engaging with doctors, hospitals, and so on and so forth. Incubators facilitate some of those things. Uh, it is also, uh, you know, there, there might be facilitation for uh, funders. There might be facilitation required for intellectual property, technology uh, licensing. Uh, many of these things which, you know, uh, are roles which incubators are expected to play, but it's basically a place which I, I one more important role which I tell people is that being an entrepreneur is not an easy journey, okay? And it's useful and important to meet other entrepreneurs pursuing similar journeys. So a very important part of an incubator environment is also meeting other peers who have done, walked that journey not necessarily only seeing your professors or your students uh, who are a different breed. Uh, you need to see entrepreneurs who are taking risks, who are looking into the future, uh, who are working on daring ideas, taking up risks and talking to them. And uh, 
you know it's a lonely journey and everybody might call you a fool in the beginning uh, in which case you need a lot more fools along with you to support you right so that's what incubators do okay thank you sir so there's also one question from jaya sindhu can we co incubate while holding big grant yeah so see the big grant is a grant program right so uh, as uh, uh, i think uh, shalini also mentioned uh, see the big partners role is to administer the contract okay the big in that an incubator there can be anybody you can even co incubate that's not a problem but you need to show that you have the facility which you can uh, which you need the relevant capabilities that you need or the networks that you need uh, for executing the project successfully that's what where it comes in so big grant you can you can co incubate there's no problem right but you'll have to show locations where you are going to use and uh, which which are the locations that you are going to um um you know where the facilities are available where the right resources connects and everything are available okay and each incubator will have their own policy so you need to figure out how uh, to navigate that <laughs> so another question from dr deepa ghosh is can someone initiate a startup while working as a government faculty yeah so in uh, uh, in 2009 there is a dsir notification that came out which basically uh, allows this uh, it is uh, only thing is your uh, organization has to adopt it uh, as a um, uh, policy uh, and roll out a scheme within your organization so several government organizations have adopted it research organizations and have rolled it out so under that scheme um you know it's possible for faculty to uh, participate in startups in different ways it also gives uh, um uh, certain uh, certain uh, concessions and certain uh, exemptions from central government service rules uh, as well okay so this is possible um, separately maybe uh, we can uh, if you just search for dsir uh, om you should get it Uh, but otherwise, you just write to Pallavi. We'll be able to send you the link to it. But your your university or your uh, institution has to adopt it, okay, and roll it out. CSIR did it in two thousand and nine. IITs have done it uh, separately, and so on and so forth. DBT institutions have, DST institutions have. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. So the next question is from E. Wasan. So Pallavi, I think you'll run out of time, also, right? So maybe last question. the last yeah. question yeah some startups when they don't want to explore the technology know how portion or um, the patent part i think they don't want to um, uh, you know reveal the technology know how portion or the patent part of the project will the application be considered during the technical evaluation yeah so during the initial review process <coughs> the reviewer has only the benefit of what you put in the application if they don't Uh, one of the things they are asked to review uh, is is the technology sound will it work uh, is it novel and those kind of questions so if they ha- don't have enough information uh, they cannot uh, review it and therefore they will say that they cannot review it or that there is not enough information or they just refuse it saying that there is not enough it, you know there's nothing to gauge out here <coughs> so my suggestion to startups and entrepreneurs is <coughs> that uh, um, you know if you look carefully at your idea you will find that uh, maybe 90% of it is already known okay in different literature in different ways and so on and so forth right so if you break up your ideas into say 10 parts and look at it carefully you might find that you can actually talk freely about nine of them and uh, one of them if you think that that's key uh, you Uh, may want to uh, you may want to uh, 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 give a sense of what it is uh, but if you say that this is the part this is the x part of it which is confidential uh, that's a little better approach than not revealing anything at all because then it's not possible to review it uh, big reviewers do sign a confidentiality agreement by the way uh, and another thing to keep in mind is that one a, a patent Uh, once you have filed you are okay to discuss it okay because the uh, the filing date is what is important uh, even if it's not published yet 
by the way all patents finally get published right in 18 months or so so it will be visible to everybody but it's the date when you filed it that's important so the moment you have filed it you are okay to speak about it and uh, that is another approach that you can take as well which is that go ahead and uh, generate enough data to file a at least a preliminary patent application and then talk about it uh, alternatively uh, talk about all the nine parts and the one part you say that this is the part that I'm keeping confidential rather than trying to fool around, be very straight about it. Okay. So mm -hmm. I think Pallavi, uh, uh, yes, we'll stop here because I don't want Milind waiting. Yes, yeah. sir. Yes, sir. I'll just request all the collaborators and speakers to on their videos. We'll uh, take a quick picture right now. Deepika, I request you for a quick picture of all the collaborators. Yes. Uh, everyone ready? Please smile. Yes. Yeah. I'm just clicking one more. Please smile again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Lipika. Appreciate it. So uh, I would like to thank Dr. Premnath for all the insights uh, that you uh, gave on how one can design and go about uh, validating that technology. I would like to now request um, our next speaker, Mr. Malin Chaudhary, the founder and CEO at We Innovate Bio Solutions Private Limited. A brief bio of Dr. Milan Chaudhary is that he's, uh, um, uh, he started uh, incubating at NCL Innova Innovation Park, Pune. Uh, he has previously worked with uh, Serum Institute of India, Pune Ranbaxi Labs, uh, Mumbai Re Rematrix, Bangalore, and Thomas Baker, Mumbai. He has obtained his master's in biotechnology from GHRIIT, Nagpur, and PhD in microbiology from CNB Agarkar Research Institute. University of Pune. He's a microbiologist at heart and works in the area of technology development. He has previously developed technologies like UTI, RAP, a rapid UTI detection kit and a DNA wrap, a one-step DNA isolation method. He has several papers and patents to his credit in the area of nanotechnology and microbiology. Uh, I would request Milan uh, to please share your screen and start your presentation. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Pallavi. I think uh, majority of the things have been uh, have already been covered by uh, Dr. Premnath, and uh, a, a good introduction about BIG grant is given by Shalini. So I'll just, uh, uh, you know, in the paucity of the time, I'll just touch upon the most important aspects which uh, you would require to ace the BIG grant. Uh, frankly speaking, BIG is one of the best grant. In fact, I started my entrepreneurial journey. Uh, with BIG itself and BIG was uh, the first founding stone of the company we innovate by solutions that we have built today and uh, moving forward with the company. Uh, when we go, I got my BIG, I was actually a scientist. So I call myself a science entrepreneur. So I turned from a scientist to entrepreneur now. And uh, my BIG was in round five. Uh, there, uh, the weightage of the value, uh, you know, evaluation process was more on the technology aspect of the product because a lot of scientists were applying uh, at that point of time. But now I think the weightage has shifted from being more on technology heavy to be how those can be converted into a real enterprises and real companies and how startups can be formed out of those brilliant ideas which the scientists are coming from. So uh, I think Pallavi has already given my uh, introduction. So I'll just skip this. Uh, introduction portion and directly come to the most important aspect about when now when you are planning to apply for BIG, what are the most important things that you need to uh, put under your buckle so that uh, you know the BIG uh, comes out uh, very easily uh, to you and the most important aspects uh, behind it. I still uh, would suggest that the BIG grant is more suited for people who are now initiating their entrepreneurial journey or already have proof of concept and now trying to validate that proof of concept and take it forward. So either people who have recently formed startups or planning to form startups, uh, scientists who want to you know, try out on an entrepreneurial journey are one of the best fits for BIG. The companies who are already formed and now trying to you know, apply for BIG for a bridge gap kind of op uh, opportunity, I think Bayrak have multiple other schemes uh, by which they can apply. 
so for all the people who are now planning to uh, you know write uh, for big or starting their entrepreneurial journey there are few very important aspects that they need to now uh, you know study and do it properly so i think the first and foremost important aspect in writing any proposal is the problem statement i think you should give more weightage to identifying and talking about the problem because big is a very broad uh, uh, kind of grant which is given in multiple sectors so whether it is you know agri medtech drugs pharma multiple other segments that is why the evaluation member who are sitting have will, will be having a very broad understanding so it is your responsibility to give them a real understanding of the problem statement so i think the and the first thing that they would also read is the problem statement how big is the problem and all the sort of thing so i think uh, the primary weightage while writing about the big grant should be on the problem statement you should be uh, you know very uh, it should be very well articulated and a thoroughly studied kind of problem statement because once they identified that the problem is bigger then they would you know go how you are solving that solution what is your solution and how different is your solution and those kind of things second is uh, a very well executable plan because a lot of people who write uh, and comes from a science background uh, have a very weak understanding about writing the business plans and the complete we have a good understanding of project uh, writing and all uh, but uh, how do we convert that into a business plan because ultimately when you are writing a big grant and if you get a big grant it is pretty much certain that you are now trying to convert your idea for a commercial application so uh, converting the idea into commercial application becomes the most important aspect uh, whenever the big evaluation is also going on uh, third is team because uh, you know as scientists we are loners primarily so we pretty much work in individual uh, zones or you know with our students and uh, with some of our colleagues and collaborations but when we talk about a business proposition uh, then the team has to be a multi varied kind of team it cannot have all the people of the same background or maybe you know a same skill set you will have to have build a team which will have multiple skill sets together and that's how uh, uh, and while evaluating your application they would also look at you know how are you structuring your team in terms of achieving the goals that you want to achieve and fourth is understanding of project financing this is something that is the most important aspect because big comes with very strict guidelines about budget and where to utilize your budget and how to utilize your budget and if you stick to that then only your big will be successful this is not only pre big but i would say during big and post big also an activity which needs to be done uh, with a thorough understanding of uh, you know the project financing aspect and multiple other things in between uh, if we have to dig dig deep in when i'm saying problem statement identification there are two major uh, aspects to a problem statement one is either your problem statement very big in terms that uh, you know for example if you are in the field of agriculture or if you are in the field of uh, you know developing something which is for a larger masses wherein you don't are actually developing a solution for a specific set of people then your problem statement is big that means the application or the customer base is also going to be very big but is it going to be valuable uh, is a question that to be asked i mean 1 rupee from everybody or 10 rupee from 10 people or 100 people from a value proposition point of view whether that value is matching the number of people is a balance that you will always have to uh, keep in sometimes it may happen that your problem statement and the solution that you are giving is for everybody for example in agriculture i am solving a problem which will be uh, applicable for all the farmers across india but would the farmer will be able to able to pay so your problem statement is bigger uh, your solution is also able to solve a problem which is bigger but is it going to give you enough amount of money so that it becomes a sustainable uh, kind of a business venture or not is this this is the most important aspect then the second aspect is yes i am working in a very niche area but the solution that i am providing is solving a bigger uh, you know pocket uh, hole in in the end of customer so the customer is ready to pay a premium uh, for the solution that i am offering so even if my problem statement is into niche area it's not big customer base but the value wise the customer is higher so you will have to always keep a balance between these so whenever you are identifying your problem statement articulate this into a very well manner uh, in terms of how many people uh, for how many people you are developing the solution uh in terms of number of people along with that what is the value attached to the solution that you are offering for the problem statement that you are uh, solving so uh, this is a balance that if you can you know very well done into your uh, very well do into your problem statement would help you uh, uh, write your proposal very well 
then uh, one of the most important aspect during the problem statement is thorough background research and you have to be completely thorough in terms of uh, you know identifying everything so uh, pretty much majority of the big application when they come from a science background are mostly science heavy so there are more uh, aspects of technology and detailing about that yes those are important aspects but at the same time uh, you will have to also understand that you are writing it for increase uh, you know putting it into a business proposition so how are you going to execute this into a business proposition which is matter and which dr premna rightly told you how are you going to execute the experiments a lot for that the background research also needs to be done in terms of what are the regulatory processes for regulatory processes what are the set of experiments that you would do for your own understanding what are the set of experiments that you will do for validating the for validating the results what are the set of experiments that you will do so we'll have to do a thorough background research it's not just the background research that we do typically in the science uh, based uh, sort of thing i'm not talking about the solution because solutions are usually tailor made and i think you would be the right person to talk about your solution because once the problem statement is very well defined you can easily write uh, you know how your solution is solving that problem statement so solution is something that i'm not focusing in my talk right now uh, the second most important aspect comes about in your writing of the proposal because you know majority of the proposals are reject rejected only because of the reason that they are not written very well so uh, writing of the proposal uh, makes important when you are actually writing it from a plan, point of view of writing a business plan even if you don't have a startup you are just a scientist applying for a big grant you can still write a good business plan because uh, you know uh, this is ultimately going to be a commercially viable kind of a thing because uh even if now government is giving you a grant but they are also going to uh, evaluate you on the process wherein whether that grant going to uh, increase or make the value in the society so for them the indicators of progress are like how uh, are you really forming a company is this company going to become profitable at some point of time so that the tax can be given to the government and thus then the grant money can be recovered or are you increasing the employability or employment into the market so something like these things are indicators for them so you have to consider all these indicators at this stage inside your proposal and then give it so that it becomes a very lucrative kind of proposition for them to uh, fund you whether it is even a, a grant so when i'm saying executable plan uh, you know there are three most important aspect of writing any proposal the first uh, important study that you need to do is identify stakeholder i think dr premnar touched upon a lot of stakeholders in this process whether it is regulatory uh uh processes whether it is uh, you know nabl accredited laboratories or multiple other people who are into the stakeholder uh, you, you know becomes become stakeholder at some point of time into your process so starting from the collaborator with whom you will going to do research the companies whom you are going to you know uh, touch upon for the customer understanding to executing the research hiring manpower uh to ultimately executing uh, the product prototype and then reaching out to the market all these people are the stakeholders and is a completely different set of people not that something which we have already touched upon so i think at a primary level if you could act, actually reach out to these people and touch upon who are the stakeholders identify them what are their understandings it will very it will be very helpful for you to write the proposal very well uh then required resources this is a planning that i know we all do very well but then uh, you know the kind of resources that we think are required uh, once we get the big grant and start working in a completely different mindset which is from a company point of view along with 18 months timeline and with a limited amount of money we have to very well manage our resources and they have to be streamlined with our strategy of moving forward because uh you know uh, the plan the proposal is evaluated at every milestones and you have to hit the milestone then only the money is disbursed for the next milestone so uh, beforehand only you know manage your resources and find out what are the resources where are you going to get in fact i would suggest get the quotations beforehand uh, before even writing the proposal and then comes the business plan writing so this is something which is a very standard format wherein it comes out uh, to be uh, it's called as a business plan canvas everything that would you would require for forming a company and all the stakeholders everything comes out into a one sheet of paper i think this exercise is very important even if you have a simple idea in your mind and you are just thinking about writing a proposal just put that idea into this paper and you'll auto automatically come to know what are the things that you need to do how are you going to execute and then convert it into a proper proposal uh, which you will write uh, for the big grant so this is a very important aspect 
as i pointed out team is very important because uh, you know multiple other people are going to join you during the journey and if you have made a decision that i am going to form a company post my uh, big grant or during my big grant then i think uh, you should start working on the team right now because that uh, that way you can write uh, the proposal and you can uh, include the team members into uh, in, into the portion because uh, uh frankly telling you identifying the team identifying the right set of people is the most important aspect and a lot of bigger companies in fact we are now 5 years old but this is something which is still a primary focus area for us and even the companies who are listed larger companies still have uh, you know very strong focus on identifying the team members identifying uh, each and every uh, you know person who would work with you so i think uh, you know there are few core values that you have to set for your own company whenever you are thinking that you want to form a company at later point of time but you'll have to set up some core values and then you have to find people who would you know align along with you towards this core value and then only the strong team comes out together and then the execution becomes easy because if you are spending too much time in uh, having a dialogue and understanding each others uh, you know psyche and then uh are putting time in executing something it would it would definitely you know delay your process to a longer period of time so i think identifying those team members wherein you don't have to spend too much time in explaining them what what you are thinking and how you are thinking if both of you are aligned initially then you can spend more time on execution part which is more important uh, moving forward and lastly i would say this is something that a lot of people lack initially uh, during the proposals but i wouldn't say it just go and do an accounting course or something like that but a lot of resources are very easily available for example uh, you know simple excel sheets are available wherein you can do budget financing uh, you can uh, you know do a little market research the market research reports are also available so using this there are uh, you know aspects of project financing which are important because uh, uh, trust me the moment you get the big grant the timer starts ticking the money comes to your account and then proper budgeting and spending of the money timely becomes the most important aspect so you ultimately become that person who has to manage money first and then your scientific things remain on a uh, back foot so if you want to manage both the things properly i would say for budgeting uh, for you know properly managing of money just keep that budgeting thing into a proper understanding before even you write the big grant because uh, these are the things which are going to be the most important thing so when i am saying budgeting what are the equipment you are going to buy as i told you try to get the quotations beforehand what are the chemicals that you would require what are the quantities of the chemicals that you would require try to negotiate with the people if the quantities are more at this stage itself and then you will come to know whether Or whatever you are thinking and writing into BIG grant, whether it is executable in fifty lakh rupees or not, if you require more than that or less than that, uh, if you require more than that, how are you going to manage more than that uh, if if it is required? Because uh, the evaluators will easily identify if you write a proposal and if it is not fitting into fifty lakh budget, then your proposal is automatically rejected. So budgeting becomes a very important aspect. another aspect is pnl statement why i am saying this might not be important for you to write the grant but this is important to give you a aspect about the business profitability point of view of your uh, you know uh, idea because ultimately this idea is going to turn into a startup and ultimately if that startup has to survive they have to become profitable at some point of time so profitability becomes very important so for example if you are saying that i am developing a dna based vaccine uh the development cost of my dna based vaccine versus the profit i'm uh, going to earn when i'm selling into the market along with the time that is required and the interest that i have to pay for the amount of money that i've spent if you do that calculation you'll come to know that oh i don't think this this is a proposal that i should write for a big grant then you have to change your proposal so ultimately reworking on your proposal uh, uh, it's better that you do this exercise now so that the first proposal gets easily accepted and then you can focus on uh that specific idea and move forward and finally comes to uh, to the part of funding as i as i said no harm in writing very ambitious projects but it i am sure that those ambitious projects will not be uh, you will not be able to complete it in 50 lakh rupees so let's say you would require more amount of money right now only think about where are you going to raise this more amount of money is it is it a project which is uh, which will be attract uh, which will be attractive for vcs which will be attractive to uh, you know crowdfunding platforms or which will be attracted to your friends or families who would give you money or it will be attracted uh, attractive to angel kind of platform so if you do these kind of study a little bit 
early what i would suggest is even if you want to write a very ambitious project it will become very easy for you to fit that ambitious project into the proposal which is more easy for the evaluators to evaluate and also becomes acceptable uh, to the big grant so i think if you take care of these four uh, aspects uh, pretty much you know in the first hit itself you, there are very good chances that you will uh, get the big grant because now the big proposals are also evaluated more from a business point of view is what my understanding is with this i will stop here if there are any questions you will be happy to ask thank you yeah there was one request you know if you could enlarge and show the business plan proposal part the one that you talked about the canvas okay uh, i think if you google business plan canvas uh, it is available everywhere yeah so yeah we can see that now yeah so pretty much it talks about as i told you the stakeholders the resources everything that i told about is the cost structure uh, revenue stream that means the profits who is going to pay you your customers what are the customer segmentation of the uh, market who is your exact customer so as i told you if you try to understand the stakeholder somebody asked about kol so you know in customer segment so for example we work in a medical device industry so for us it's a very complex path which not that you know i do an advertisement for a general public and the general public looking at the advertisement get influenced and buy my product it's, it does not happen that way we have multiple stakeholders so for example for in our case the decision maker is different uh, the buyer is different and the customer uh, who pays for it is different so for example we sell catheters so the catheter is inserted into the patient patient pay or a insurance pay so ultimately the money comes from insurance or the patient but my buyer is not the patient or the insurer my buyer is a hospital who does a bulk buy who negotiates the price with me and you know stocks my catheters into the hospital but the purchase person also does not take the decision of buying my catheter because there are multiple other catheters available into the market so then the decision makers become doctor so there are three stakeholders that i have to influence and the person who uses my product is a completely different person who is a nursing staff so they are users so in in the whole process who is the first person who takes a decision of whether to buy the innovate buy solution product or xyz product is the doctor so he is my kol i have to influence him and with the studies as dr premnath said and then he makes a decision okay fine i want to use this product so then the purchase department comes into the role and then negotiation then so your pitch to doctor is different your pitch to the user who is nursing staff is different your pitch to uh, the purchase department is different and then your presentation to the end customer is a completely different picture so this is the way you have to identify your stakeholder your uh, i don't know about others maybe you know agri or other things in agriculture also uh, agri field also there are multiple stakeholders so the things which looks so easy uh somebody does a ad of a soap and then we buy the soap looking at the ad is it's not as simple as for the at least the technology businesses that we pretty much run and be ig sponsors in yeah well, there was one question which was earlier about kol and uh, since you spoke about it uh, whether you know i think it was from dr abhay kute whether they should consider funders or investors as kol so i think i answered to that question so basically see Uh, KOL is nothing but an influencer. So somebody who who will influence. So for example, if I am working in cardiology, a top cardiologist in my uh, area will be KOL, and KOL can be regional also. For example, uh, in Pune city, uh, Doctor X Y Z is a top cardiologist, and if he is using my product, he is an influencer. He will say, I am use I have used this product. and i have found these results now you have to use or not it is your personal choice is what kol will say but uh, you know a lot of people say oh this is a respectable doctor he is using the product let me also try use my product so he is influencing the population to buy your product that's a kol so an investor or a funder can be kol only for the next round of investment that you want to raise so for example we have been funded by cherate ventures and they are a very reputed name in the industry so my next coming investor would say oh i think this company has been invested by chirate ventures so that means there is some gratitude uh, gravity to the problem statement or maybe it can be a good good business proposal so let me at least look at it but uh, i'll tell you from an investment point of view none of the investor get very easily influenced by all those things they will do a thorough due diligence they have their own plans to invest 
and that's how investment ecosystem works so i think influence to influence sort of thing ha- might happen into trading or uh, when you are already a listed company into stock market it's a completely different story but at a technology level when you want to position your company i think the first person to influence is government of india and maybe through big if you could do it uh that is how your influencing pathway would work so i think kewal today in today's date a lot of social media influencer are kewals basically people who are having uh, you know larger user bases are kewals okay yeah that answers the one last question uh, is uh, from jay sindhu is it mandatory to form a team while applying for big does the score get affected if there is no team formed presently i think now it is very competitive uh, there will be multiple applications so i i would suggest it would be better to uh, you know tick all the uh, columns in your application do not leave any column uh, and left even if your proposal is very good and they would want to fund you but some other proposal might have everything which is required and they might get funded so mm, i would still suggest that uh, you know even if just go and touch base try to add people if you don't want to add people into as team members try to add them as consultants or advisors into the team so you don't have you don't have a very strong engagement at this stage but you know at a later stage whenever you want you can reach out to these people okay so i think um if there are no more questions i mean i would like to thank all the speakers and collaborators i mean it was really very insightful you know you touched on the very very important points uh, you know uh, of of uh, forming a uh, uh, team uh, also problem statement and uh, project financing i really thank you for giving your time and coming for this uh, talk thank you thank you yeah thank you so much all right thank you melin thanks a lot yeah yeah thank you dr prem thank you all i will uh, close the session this talk is also available on youtube if anybody has missed or you want to revisit certain parts you could go on youtube and check on the venture centers brbc youtube channel okay thank you collaborators thank, thank you pallavi thank you pallavi thank you yeah pallavi. thanks anand bye bye thanks bhuvan sudha thank you for coming thank you thank you yeah bye bye so um, we are going to have a q and a session also uh, next week so if anybody has any queries uh, they can also i'll share the links with all of you um, to join the uh, session so if there are any last minute queries on how to fulfill the proposal or any specific um, you know instances of uh, how to go about doing something please uh, feel free to you know join i will send the zoom links um, those who have registered will get the zoom link and i would urge everybody to you know come out there and you know we also learn from each other's questions so a big good idea all right take care bye bye thank you ma'am yep thank you thank you team for the wonderful event thank you so much thank you bhuvan thanks thank you ma'am